Hello YouTube, this is Skip, coming to you live, straight out of Real House Sickles Aquatic Kennel. Come on in, and welcome to Fish Law One YouTube channel. Before we get started with part two of this video series, I would like to thank all of you who have been supporting me throughout the years. Below this video, in the description area, you will find links to all of Real Heart Sickness merchandise. Now, let's pick up where we left off in part one of this video series. Okay, let's recap. In part one of this video series, we went over what was a Amphilopus cichlid species. Also, we covered what was a species slash subspecies utilizing the GM car knowledge. Let's turn the page and talk about how did we get so many subspecies and variants from one species and why is it that we started classifying them during the early 2000s? Now, it's my suspicion that certain people decided to start classifying the different antelope species and subspecies due to the enormous growth and popularity of the hybrid flower horn sickens. You see, I say this because in the 70s, 80s, even the 90s, there was no rush to classify these Amphilopus centralinum species and subspecies, especially the barb variations. But then you fast forward to early 2000 when the flower horns popularity had grown and it hit the United States. All of a sudden, we was in a mad rush to start naming and classifying all the different centralinum Amphilopus Bob variations and so on and so forth. Check this out folks. A lot of people wanted to debate me about this topic years ago but they never presented any documentation to substantiate their position and you know what I say about having documentation but just in case you are new to my channel I will introduce you to my saying. Documentation beats conversation all day long. Now, for years, we have been given newly discovered cichlid descriptive names or classifying them by collection point. I see nothing wrong with that, although the endemic people of these collection points already knew of these now popular cichlid species for generations. But you must ask yourself, why now, all of a sudden, we're in a mad rush to classify all these different subspecies. You see, I'm a firm believer that you must have some sort of breed standards before classifying species. You have to have some common knowledge of genetics. You have to have studied biology and ichthyology, in my opinion. You can't just be someone who photograph fish and then decide to name them, or someone who just collect fish without a degree behind it stating that you are a biologist or ichthyologist and you just decide to name the fish after yourself or what have you. And this is not a shot at the people who have done that. And I don't know for certain if the people who have done it have degrees in those particular areas that I spoke of or that I'm speaking of. But the fact is this, there are no such thing as breed standards in this hobby for any fish, let alone the Amphilopus species complex. I've tried to introduce breed standards before, and I will. I will introduce it in another form. But I got pushback from it, which I thought was crazy. But I do know that distributors, certain distributors would like for most of you guys to be ignorant to the fact, and so they can sell you all types of so-called newly discovered breeds when they really already exist and they were distributing these fish long before the flower horns exist, long before 2000. We used to call the so-called reddest leaders and the bard is leaders. They had a bard, bard is leaders that we used to call blue devils. Of course, that was incorrect, but that's what we used to call them back in the day. And then we used to call the other ones redhead centronellums or red, uh, Costa Rican redhead. Midas. 
Now you have so many different redhead centronellums, but they all are classified under one name, particularly the Islitas name. Then you have some people or distributors that classify them under their own descriptive name, Red Shoulder Midas, or, you know, myself including. I call my particular brand the Red Head Islitas Bloodline. But before we end part two of this video series, here are some examples of what we just discussed. This is a Costa Rican redhead centronellus. And this is a redhead barred mitis, which is better known as a red islitis, but only because we just applied that name islitis to this particular species. It's been around forever. And here is an example of a red head as leaders, which is my particular bloodline where I isolated the red eye trait, similar to my pyrotrimex bloodline. But make no mistake about it, I am not renaming the species or subspecies. I'm just naming my particular bloodline due to the trait that I isolated. Now, at the end of the day, all of these species are red head centronellums. And in most cases, you can find them migrating from point A to point B, from different parts of the lake, from these leaders all the way down to the Salinas Islands. Now, make sure you watch part one of this video series because it's important that you watch these videos in order. So that you can gain a greater understanding of what I'm explaining to you. Now, sticking with my GM analogy. In part three of this video series. We're going to discuss the similarities between species, subspecies, and variants, starting with the gold bar mitis and the armorello. And with that said, this skip, I'm out.